worship our King this morning. Come on, let's clap it out. We're in the house of the Lord today. Come on. Come on, sing this with us. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who ever more will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging seas. Our God, He holds the victory. Come on, you sing it. In the house of the Lord, it's true in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your threat. Every battle 
Sing it like we believe. When I lift my voice and shout, every war comes crashing down. I have the authority. Jesus has given me. When I open up my mouth, me start breaking out I have the authority that Jesus has given me when I lift my voice and shout every war comes crashing down I have the authority Jesus has given me when I open up my mouth, miracles stop breaking out. I have the authority. Jesus has given me. Every battle you won, and I am who you say I am. Crown me with confidence, I have seen it in the heavenly place, undefeated by the power of your name. I have seen it in the heavenly place, undefeated. Come on, let's sing it one more time. You are my champion. Giants fall and you stand undefeated. Every battle you won, and I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence. I am seated in the heavenly place, undefeated by the power of your name. I am seated. The heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it.
Can't do it. We'll see 
not seen? Have you not seen? Have you not heard? The everlasting Father, it is He who sits on the throne. And there is no one like Him. There is no one who can remove His plan from the hands of men. Oh, partner, and commit yourself to this partnership with the Lord of glory. For as he comes through this world, through our state, through our community, know that he is the Lord and he's come with the last word. He's come with the power of almighty God in his mouth. And he speaks and declares, everything that you have heard the opposite of. God is on the throne. He is ruling and reigning. And there is nothing that is impossible for him to do. So lift up your eyes. Have renewed hope. Walk in the strength of it. And see if the faith of the church of Jesus Christ in the Lord of glory will not usher in all that God has planned for these last days. Oh, Father, we rejoice in you because we know that every plan you have is not just a big general plan, but it's also a very specific plan for us, for us individually. And so, Lord, we submit to you now the Lord of glory knowing that all you desire to see and do on the earth shall come to pass. We love you. We honor you. We worship you today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Somebody's being healed right now. Right now. Freedom is coming to you right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Oh, we worship you. Oh, we worship you. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. We magnify your name, Jesus. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. We magnify you, oh God. the God of hope keep you safe in the arms of Jesus for your hope is a living hope it's not just a word that is dead but it's filled with the life of God so receive hope today for your challenge in Jesus name we pray amen
Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. So glad you are here today. Find a half dozen, if not more, people that you can love and greet before you're seated. Will you do that? everybody. So good to see you here today. So glad to have you at this Christmas season. We're just delighted that you are here today. So welcome. Welcome to OV Church. If this is your first time with us, we give you a great big welcome. We hope that you feel right at home and we're just so happy that you're here today. And we would uh, ask you to do us the honor and the favor of stopping by the Welcome Center on your way out we have a gift we'd like to give you and just to get to know you a little bit better. So again, welcome, welcome. Well, girls, we had a great night on Friday night at our Christmas by Design and so glad so many of you were able to attend that. It was really, really fun. And so we just want to bring your attention to a few more things that are coming up. You know, we weren't made to do life alone. And so it's really good to be connected in a small group. And so we have a few small groups that you can join. Just coming up, some activities, some, um, not activities. Well, they will have activities at them, but some gatherings, some events. Uh, but this Wednesday is our Senior Life Christmas Luncheon, and that's at 11 o'clock. And then we have our Christmas Express, which is on the 12th, so next Sunday, and that is our children's program, and that's going to be really fun, so all you parents invite all your aunts and uncles and all of that, grandmas and grandpas, and get them here. That's going to be a really great performance with an after party in the courtyard, and then we have a couple more events. Uh, the OV Youth Christmas Party is December 16th, and they're going to have that um, famous ugly Christmas sweater and a whole bunch of giveaways and things like that. And then there's a young adult Christmas event also on December 17th. And so check that out. And then we have on Christmas Eve, December 24th, a very special one hour service from five to six. And so it's just real special. So you can mark your calendar for that as well. And so a lot of wonderful things coming up in the next couple of weeks. And so we encourage you, get connected, get to know one another, and that happens at these small group events. And so um, we're just glad that you're here today, and isn't it good to serve God together? You, so good. He's so good. And so uh, it's with joy that we serve and we give of our time and our resources and get connected. And so in this time in the service, we're going to continue with our worship and our giving of our tithes and our offering. And so it's just such a joy to give and knowing that it's going to accomplish much and that he is faithful always to give you what you need and then some so that you can give again. It's in, so uh, it's just beautiful how the kingdom works that way. And so there's many ways to give. You can give online, oakvalleychurch.org. You can give on your phone app, the OV Church app, 
if you came prepared today with cash or check and you would like a tithe envelope, if you raise your hand, our team will be glad to get you one. Um, you can also pick them up at the giving boxes out in the lobby and put your offering right in there. And so uh, we thank you for your faithfulness in this. Together, we're making a difference in the Inland Empire and throughout the ends of the earth with our missionary support as well. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. You are so good and so faithful. We thank you for this time of the year when we can celebrate the birth of, of Jesus your son, our savior. We thank you for that precious gift. Father, we uh, choose to follow him. And we just thank you for this opportunity to give in our tithes and our offerings. And we just honor you with it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. How many of you believe our world needs an infusion of hope? We need hope like never before. And that's what I love about Christmas. It is a time whereby Christ the Lord is able to infuse hope into a world that is desperately in need of it. And so uh, today I'm going to begin our Christmas series. We're going to talk about Christmas hope. Christmas hope today. Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. The Bible says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus, Christ the son of David, the son of Abraham. Verse 2, Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. From there we go to verse 16, because everything in between is so-and-so begot so-and-so, and so on and so forth. But by the time we get to verse 16, it says, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Verse 17 tells us, So, All the generations from Abraham, where we begin, to David, are 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ, Jesus, born in Bethlehem, are 14 generations. There are three sets of 14 generations from Abraham to Jesus. The number 14 represents salvation. It represents redemption. On the 14th day of the first month of the Jewish calendar, God manifested in the flesh on earth in the form of Jesus Christ. The wonderful thing about that is not only that Christ the Savior is born, But hope in Christ came to a dark, sickened world. Our world today is dark, it's evil, and it is sick. It needs some medicine. It needs an infusion of hope. The Apostle Paul summed up our desperate situation without Christ when he said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, In those days you were living apart from Christ, you were excluded from citizenship among uh, the people of Israel, you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. This describes all of us pre-Christ, pre-being born again, pre-conversion. And you lived in this world without God and without hope. When people have no hope, It's hard to live. It's hard to get through everything that you need to get through. And the Apostle Paul summed up that kind of a desperate situation of people living in a world without God and without hope. It basically means that Jesus Christ is absolutely uh, our, our hope. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, the New Living Translation says, this letter is from Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, appointed by the command of God, our Savior, and Christ Jesus, who does what? Gives us hope. The New American Standard Bible says it this way, Paul, an apostle of Christ, according to the commandment of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope. So, not only does Christ give us hope, he is our hope. So, in a world that is desperately in need of hope, there's only one answer. 
That's why we're here today. To be infused with the power of the hope of Christ, the gospel, the good news, and then take that hope to people who are living without it. Hope is found in a person whose name is Jesus Christ. So if Christmas tells us anything, it tells us that there is always hope. There is only hope in Christ Jesus. Today I'm going to share with you three things about hope uh, that I trust you can make application uh, to your own life. And the first of which is this. Number one, hope looks up. Hope always looks up. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, the, the Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Now, at the time of Jesus' birth, the world was in absolute chaos. Darkness covered the face of the earth. Political corruption was such that uh, the, the income of the people was charged, they were being charged 50 to 60% of their income in taxes. And that those taxes didn't even fix the roads. It went into the pockets of corrupt politicians. Now, I'm not trying to make any... <laughs> Herod the king was brutal. He was a violent dictator. He was not in it for the people. The people were oppressed. And in all of this darkness, the star of hope appeared. Now you might ask, well, what is the star of hope? Well, we see it on top of every little nativity scene. We see it on top of Christmas trees. The star of hope represents the coming of Jesus Christ, the light of the world that shines in gross, deep darkness. We know that that light directed shepherds, the wise men, to Bethlehem. It was the star that caused everybody to look up and away from what they were experiencing. And today in the world, people need to look up we're so busy looking around us and looking down and, and what's in front, what's behind, what's to the side that is threatening to destroy us. And, and what we really need to be doing is looking up. I'll say this, even about the believers. We spend too much time trying to figure out how to fix the problems that are assaulting us, trying to figure it out mentally, getting angry when we really need to be looking up because whenever it gets dark, God will always send the star of hope. So it was the star that caused, caused them in that day to look up, up from darkness, up from evil. We need to be looking up from pandemics and vaccinations and hopelessness. We need to look up to where real true hope comes from. Hope always, always, always looks up. Like the star in Jesus' entrance into the world uh, that pointed to God's plan, God's hope for the world. Hope is the star over your life, over my life. It's the star over our children's life and our children's children's life. It's the star over whatever ails us, whatever situation that we face that, that we can't find a way through. The challenges of life. Hope is the star, it's the living hope that God has given to us. But you've got to look up. I, I just want you to get this today. Stop looking this way. Because there's nothing good to see. Look up. That's where the star of hope is. I read a story uh, about Thomas Edison. And in, and in December of 1914... A great fire uh, destroyed his laboratories over, in his day, and this is a lot of money, over $2 million worth of equipment was destroyed. His life work and the records of, of all that he had done 
was destroyed, most of it, in that fire. And as that fire was raging, his son, Charles, went running, looking for him. And he, and he finally found him standing just a few feet away from the burning building. And his, his face was red from the flames that, that were glowing. And, his, and when uh, Thomas Edison saw his son come running to him, Dad, I've been looking for you. He said, go find your mother. Quickly, go, go find your mother. She'll never see another thing like this for the rest of her life. The next morning, he stood there in the ashes of his life's work. And his son, Charles, wrote that he heard his father say these words. There's great value in disaster. All our mistakes are burned up. Thank God we can start over. Now that's somebody who's looking up. Not looking down. Not looking around, Lamentations 3, verses 22 <coughs> through 24. says, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions don't fail us. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore... I hope in him. Hope always looks up. Second thing that we need to know today about hope is it's always got to be first. Hope has to be first. Proverbs 13, verse 12, New Century Version. Well, the New, New International Version says, It's sad not to get what you hope for, but wishes that come true are like eating fruit from the tree. New Century Version says, Hope that comes true. It's, it's like eating fruit from the tree uh, of life. Uh, this scripture verse tells us that hope is first. You don't get to the fruit without planting seed first. Hope always, always, always comes first. Everybody wants God to do something in their life. Everybody wants God to help them push through the challenge of their life. Everybody wants God to heal them. Everybody wants God to resource them. Everybody wants God to save their spouse or save their children or shake up somebody who needs to be shaken up. And yet, you're not going to receive from the Lord unless you first plant the seed of hope. Hope always, always comes first. There's no desire comes to pass. No fruit comes to pass until hope has been planted. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, New Living Translation, says faith is a confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Even faith, which is how we receive from the Lord, is the substance of things that you hope for first. Hope always comes first. So we must, we must, we must, we must give hope the first place in our hearts and minds. Every morning. But every time I watch the news, Pastor, I'm so discouraged and disgusted. I see something and it just seems, seems so hopeless. Stop giving communicators, other than God, your first hope. Your first thought. Your first hope needs to be what God is speaking. Hope, like tithing, is a first thing's truth. That without it, your desires will not happen. There's no fruit without hope going first. Here's what Scripture says. Hopelessness is going to do this to you unless you get planted in your heart and life hope. First, I mean, I, I think about my own life. I wake up every morning and there are going to be challenges in that day. I know there are. And I'm not going to face those challenges unless I get set and square. Usually when I'm driving to the office, I know what my schedule is. I know what's going to come down. I get set and square in my heart and my life. All right, this is not going to be as bad as I think it's going to be. All right, some really good things are going to come out of this. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get through this thing, and it's going to be uh, really for my betterment, for the betterment of the church. 
If you don't get hope set in you, you're in trouble. Here's some things that can happen when hopelessness arrives on the scene. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 11. Uh, this is the, the scripture verse in the center of uh, the passage about the valley of dry bones. And it says, Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, Our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Now, there's a whole lot in that verse that hopelessness does. But here's, here are three things. It'll dry you up, you'll lose hope, and you'll get cut off from what God has planned for you if you're in a hopeless state. you got to get revved up and revived up and refreshed up with a word of hope so that you can move forward. I talked to a lady at the the ladies' meeting, uh, uh, ladies' extravaganza, ladies' destiny. Ladies by design, come on. Christmas by design, okay. Well, I happened to be here, and I, a lady came up to me. She may be here in the service, I'm not sure. And she came up to me and said, Pastor, I just had to tell you something. I said, what's that? She says, my daughter is just hopeless. She, had, she, had, she couldn't have a baby and wanted to have a baby. And, and so she said, so I came down, I, I told you that I, I need you to pray for my daughter to have a baby. And um, she says, I, I'm back here to tell you that you prayed over me in proxy for her, and I'm here to tell you that she is pregnant and getting ready to deliver that baby. Now, it doesn't have a whole lot to do with me, but if any of you need a baby... God does miracles. Joyce, don't get near me. I'm not praying for you. (laughs) Hopelessness will cause you to be cut off from the promise of God. She came with hope in her heart. Hopelessness will cause you to get dry. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. Hopelessness will cause you to lose. All right. Another verse, Job responding to a friend out of his hopeless situation, Job chapter 19, verse 10. The Bible says this, Job is speaking, he tears me down. How many of you know Job went through some stuff? He tears me down on every side till I'm gone. And he uproots my hope like a tree. Well, what we know about Job is he said a whole lot of things that were wrong about God. Job said a whole lot of things that were actually foolishness. And later in the book, God corrects him. God says, Job, you better gird up your loins like a man. I got some things to tell you. And he he said, you said this, 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 and that about me. And Job, you're wrong. And And... One of the things that he was right about is that your hope can be uprooted in your life like a tree. You ever seen the big wind come and those huge trees just kind of fall over and there are all of their roots exposed? Well, without hope, when you are hopeless, that's kind of how your life can be. Uh, you, you, You break down, you get isolated, and you get uprooted from a place and from a people. Another thing that it does, Job 17, verse 15, cause you to lose vision. Where then is my hope? As for my hope, who can see it? Job couldn't. You lose vision. You lose direction. You lose hope when you are hopeless. Listen, Paul understood that he was, if he was going to make it through the maze that life is, he had to sow hope first. He had to sow hope first. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 10. I'm giving you a lot of scripture today. Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because whoever plows and threshes, plant seed, should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. Now, this particular passage, the context of it is Paul 
is actually some people who criticized him because he had made a really good living as a tent maker. He was a contractor and, and um, made a good living. And he was educated. Uh, but, you know, he had an experience with the Lord on the road to Damascus. And God said, I'm calling you. Go see Ananias. I, I have a place to call upon your life. And from that day on, he, you know, he left his, his uh, contracting business and, and he began to preach the gospel. And so people began to criticize him because there were many who were giving him money and resources, offerings to help him and keep him going uh, in, in preaching the gospel. So he got criticized for that. And so this chapter is Paul is dealing with that criticism and in it, there are some verses you may remember, you know, don't muzzle uh, the, the oxen who's treading the corn, that kind of thing. But here, what he says in all of that, he says, whoever plows and does the work, does the labor, should be able to share in the hope of the harvest. And, and while he was talking about finances and resources, that sa- very same thing Uh, absolutely applies in your life in other areas. If you'll do the work and if you'll plow and if you'll sow seed and you'll take care of that seed, you should be able to have the hope of sharing in the harvest. You got to sow first. Romans 15 verse 13 says this, and I love this word. It says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't know why every time I read that word abound, I just always picture somebody just walking. <laughs> and, and that's what God really wants us to be doing is abounding in hope. It's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. It's, it's a, a joyful thing. Uh, some people are hopeless romantics. And God wants us to be hopeless, hope mantics. Are you? Are you? Last thing, number three. Oh, this is so important. You got to get this. Hope is in you. It's in you right now. Yes, but it's in you right now. Are you a born again believer? Hope has been seated in you by the Creator. As a matter of fact, I suggest to you today that hope is in your spiritual DNA. Here's what we know about DNA. We talked about it last week. You can't pull it out. If you were created to be a man, no matter what you do to your body, you're still a man. We can prove it by DNA. And in terms of, of... Females, the same thing. If God created you with hope, it's in your spiritual DNA, it, it's just there. It, it is, it's not gone anywhere. Now, you may not be activated, may not be being used, but it's in you. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 says, For everyone born of God, who's born of God here today? Everyone born of God, every believer, every born again believer, everyone who's received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, everyone born of God overcomes the world. Everyone overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Even our faith. What does Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 say? Say, What comes first before faith? Hope. Hope. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. There is is spiritual DNA in you that no one, not even the devil, can change. You have hope seated inside of you. And you've got to give it first place so that your faith can be activated because that hope seed inside of you has the power and the ability to overcome the world and everything it throws at you. This is the victory that has overcome our faith, our, uh, the world, even our faith. Quick word to the wise. 
don't let true hope deferred. How many of you know hope gets put off by time? We're called to live lives with a lot of patience. If you, have a, if you have a hope, a seed of hope in you for something, and you know it's the plan of God, you know it's the will of God, and yet it's not coming to pass, you cannot allow your hope deferred, your hope put off. You cannot allow it to change you into a legalistic, lifeless, dead Christian. Because that's what hope deferred will do. That's exactly what it will do. Zechariah was the father of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, as you know, was the forerunner to Jesus Christ. He was to be born into the world to proclaim to the world, hope's coming, it's on the way, it's on its way. I know it's dark. It's on its way. From the foundations of the earth, Zechariah was to be the father. Elizabeth, his wife, was to be the mother of the forerunner of Jesus Christ, the hope, the light of the world. And yet, Elizabeth and Zechariah couldn't have kids. They, they, they were waiting and waiting, and it wasn't coming to pass. Now, John the, Bap- um, John the Baptist's father, uh, Zechariah, was a righteous man. He was a priest in the house of God, the temple of the Lord. Actually, Luke chapter 1, verse 6, in the New Living Translation, says that Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. And I'm not going to go into the story, but when the angel of the Lord appeared to, to Zechariah and said, I am here to tell you that you're going to have a baby. What was Zechariah's response? It's not true. It's not going to happen. Not going to happen. And yet the Bible says that he continued to do what he did as a priest in the house of the Lord. And and in, in, in God's eyes, he was righteous. I mean, he was following, following after his calling. But why was he in such... I mean, listen, if an angel of the Lord appeared to me and I fell upon my knees recognizing the presence of God and his holiness and the word of the Lord from the angel said, I have come f- for the Lord and here's what I have... To The Lord has to say to you, I don't think there'd be an ounce of unbelief in me. I'd be shaking and quaking at the presence of the Lord. Yet Zechariah said, yeah, it ain't going to happen. He was in unbelief. Why? Because that's what hope deferred does to you. Really, Hope deferred, once it sets in, it, it moves you towards being a legalistic, lifeless, religious believer in Jesus Christ. He was still doing his religious duties and doing them well, burning incense on the altar and making sure everything was taken care of, but... He had no hope. And so my question is, how many of us are like him? We're at the temple every week. We offer some form of worship to the Lord on a regular basis. But because our hope in different areas has been deferred and put off, it is caused within us a a hopeless seed that never came from the hand of God. And when you've lost hope, you've lost your ability for breakthrough because you'll never trust God and you'll never believe God. 
You're just doing your religious duties. Oh, you, you can pray. You can quote scripture. You can even give yourself spiritual goosebumps with a spiritual thought. But if your hope is deferred to the point where you are no longer, you, in your mind, God just going to have to do something miraculous. Well, it's not going to happen because hope always begins with the seed and you are the seed planter of hope. That DNA is in you. you you've just got to, to, to put it first so that everything else can follow after you. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5 describes where we get when we've lost hope. We have a form of godliness, but we deny its power. I have nothing to do with such people. Don't hang out with hopeless people. Don't rub shoulders with hopeless people. Because they may even, and I'm not saying shun people. I'm not saying, get away from me, get away from me, don't talk to me. I know that I'm a greeter, but just leave, go the other door. There's other greeters there. That's not what this is saying. This, what this is saying is you need to make sure that people don't have access to your heart. You can need to make sure that people aren't speaking into your life whose own hope is deferred in such a way that they've just given up and they're just hoping for a miracle. And, and when I say hoping for a miracle, you, you know, in football, they call it a, hay, a Hail Mary pass. At the end of the game, you know, there's no more hope. Time's out. Last play. We're a long ways from a score. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm just going to just throw it as far as I can and hope, hope somebody on my team catches it. Too many Christians are, are doing the Hail Mary in their life. And, and their, their hope has been deferred for so long that they end up here having a form of godliness. I love you, Lord. I worship you. Uh, I'm starting to sound like Elf. My, <laughs> I'm sorry. My grandkids have come over like three times this week, and we've had to watch Elf three times this week. Uh, I don't know where that came from, but we've, we, we can't find ourselves in a place where, where we're denying the power of God. We can't find ourselves in that place. That's what hopelessness does. Listen, that is not you. Listen, that is not you. You have this, the DNA of God. You have hope seeded in you by none other than Jesus Christ himself. So put that seed first. Water it. Make sure that it grows so that you can eat the fruit of it. Exercise your faith around it. Last scripture verse, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 says this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. It's not dead. It's not religious. It's alive. It's living. And it comes through the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, we started with the genealogy of Jesus from Abraham to the Son of God. And there were three sets of 14 generations that ushered in the birth of Christ in Bethlehem. And 14 means the hope of redemption. On the 14th day of the first month on the Jewish calendar is Passover. And Passover depicts the shed blood of Christ which leads to his resurrection, which leads to our redemption. So why are you so downcast, O oh my soul? Put your hope in him. Because God knew from the very beginning exactly when he was going to send Jesus to the earth. 
He knew how many generations to the person from Abraham to Joseph and Mary and the birth of Christ. He knew exactly how many generations it was going to take to usher in. It's the number of redemption. It's the number of the hope of our salvation. And he also knew the exact month and the exact day that Jesus was going to be the sacrifice to make sure that this star of hope does what it's supposed to do. And it happened on the 14th day of the first month, which leads to the sacrifice of Christ and the resurrection power of the Lord. And I'm telling you today, there is no reason to be hopeless in any way for our nation, for our world, for, for our health, for our children, our, our children's children. Whatever challenge is in your life, there is no reason to be hopeless. Put your hope in God. So today when you leave here, as you're walking to your car, just say, despite your challenges, don't be downcast. Don't you dare be downcast. I'm putting my hope. I'm activating my hope. It's my DNA. It's what I'm supposed to do. It's what I was born for. It's a living hope. And it's powered by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The same power that raised Christ from the dead now makes alive my mortal body, my mortal life. And that's the hope I'm going to live in. Amen. I love Christmas. Christmas is the star of hope that tells us in a hopeless world that we need this word now more than ever before. Amen. Christ the Lord has come. Amen. He's got this. Yeah. He's got this. Let's stand together. Thank you, Father. Oh, in Jesus' name, we receive your word. We receive your word. God, there are people today who who have come and their hope is waning. Their hope is so deferred that it's caused them to be religious and legalistic. They've been throwing Hail Mary passes and nothing is happening like they'd hoped it would. And today, Lord, I pray that each one here will recognize our DNA. We are hope carriers. We have the seed in us. And we'll water it today and put it first for us in our personal lives and for our family. I pray that each one will leave here with a renewed sense of hope. Nothing that has happened has taken you by surprise. Globally, nationally, in our state, in our neighborhood, our businesses, our lives, nothing has happened that has taken you by surprise. You're on the throne. And while we would change some things, if we could, since you are the Lord, we submit to you today and make sure that the seed of hope is alive and vibrant and growing within us. Right now, in this moment, think about your own life or the life of someone important to you. Think about the circumstances of your life and get set right now. Get set in your life. Reactivate in your life living hope. You don't have to look far for it. It's in you. Think about the, that circumstance. That situation. Think about it right now. Think about how dire things are. Think about it. Now, put over it, cover it with the hope you find in Christ and His Word. Choose 
this day whom you will serve. There's life before you. There's death before you. Choose life. Choose living hope. Amen. Amen. If you're here today and you don't have Christ in your heart and life as Lord and Savior, I'd love to pray with you. This is that moment where you are responsible to hear the still small voice of God as I speak and as I call you to a relationship with the one who created you. You must hear that still small voice deep within you. Jesus Christ is the Son of God because Adam sinned and that sin fell on all of us. We fell out of relationship with God. God loves you so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die for you on the cross. His shed blood on that cruel cross gives you an opportunity right now to come back into a relationship with your creator. Only good things can happen out of that on the earth and in eternal life beyond the earth. Will you say yes to the Lord today? I'd love the opportunity to pray with you. It's very simple. Man sinned, fell out of relationship with God. God loves you. He sent his son Jesus to die for you. Now, it's your turn. Say yes to the Lord. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Be the Lord of my life. Bible says you will be saved. There's hope for you. There's hope. If you're here and you want me to pray with you, you've never never made Christ Lord and Savior. If you're here, you want me to pray with you. You're backslidden away from God. You serve God at one time. You're not serving him today. And you want to come home to the Lord. You want to make it right. If either of these described where you are today, oh, hear the word of the Lord. Hear the power of the Holy Spirit speaking deep within you and respond. If these describe you and you want me to pray with you, both here in service and those of you watching on our online church, you want me to pray with you, I'm going to ask you right now, quickly, lift your hand, hold it high and wave it at me. Thank you. Who else? Who else? Who else? Just wave it at me until I until I am able to see you. It's me, Pastor. I need to get right with God. Listen, most of the people standing around you, they've done what you've done today. There's nothing to be um, embarrassed about. This is powerful. Right now, your decision is moving heaven. Anyone else? In-house? Watching? I need Christ. All right, here's what we're going to do. I want to pray with you. If you raised your hand, <clears throat> those of you who did, I want you to come right now and meet me here at the front. I'm going to pray with you. Come on. It's okay. I want to pray with you. Come on. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Come on. Come on. Amen. What's your name? Donald. Donald? Good to meet you, Donald. Good to meet you, man. I want to pray with you, okay, Donald? Father, I thank you. Thank you for this man. His heart is open to you. You have much for him beyond today. And Lord, I pray that your hand of grace will be upon his life as he yields to you, as he says yes to you. Show him who he is and all that you've planned. In Jesus' name. Let's pray this prayer together. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me, forgiving me, being the Lord of my life. Today, I make a commitment to follow Christ. And from this day on, I will serve you, Lord, all the days of my life. I believe that you, Jesus, you are the Son of God. You died on the cross rose again, and today 
live in my life as Lord and Savior. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Donald, bless you, man. Listen, this is John. Um, would you just go with him for just a second? I want to get some info and want to help you get started, okay? Amen. Good job. Uh, never get sold. We love and appreciate you. Thank you for being faithful to the house of God. We will see you. I'm going to be teaching on Wednesday night. We will see you from 7 to 8. Bible study. Love you. Appreciate you. God bless you.